Hello and welcome. You're watching Gravitas with me, Molly Gampir. Here's a look at what's lined up for you on the show tonight. What comes to your mind when I mention the word spying? What if an app that you are using just for fun is actually a tool for spying? What if it is actually the most widespread spying system that exists today? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. The US and Canada have banned TikTok from government devices. Why? There are cyber security concerns. All that sounds great, but why just the government devices? What about the common man's data? What is stopping them from an outright ban? Are they compromising the common man's data? Is TikTok a threat only for the government officials? We look at these questions and tell you what the US and Canada can learn from India. Also on the show for you tonight, we continue to get you the latest coming in from Pakistan as the country's economic woes continue to mount. Now, one million informal workers could end up losing their jobs because of the government's messy economic mismanagement. We all know about our planet's four layers. Turns out there is a new one now. Scientists have discovered a fifth layer in the Earth's core. And we tell you what this means for you and me. North Korean parents who let their children watch Hollywood films will be sent to prison. We tell you more. And while North Korea is up in arms against Hollywood, China is opening up its arms and embracing Hollywood. We get you a Gravita special report on China's love-hate relationship with Hollywood. A new India-UK visa scheme has kick-started. Indians who wish to live and work in the UK for up to two years can apply and vice versa. We tell you all that you need to know about this reciprocal visa scheme. And our big story tonight is about what is arguably the world's most popular app. I'm talking about TikTok. It's popular because it has become not only a source of communication, but a source of popular culture as well. But that is not our story tonight. The story lies in a question. Is TikTok fun? Or is it the most widespread system of spying that the world has ever known? Is TikTok a tool through which the Chinese government collects data on users and picks up information? I ask these questions because when India stopped TikTok in 2020, others were reluctant to follow. And today, America and Canada have taken action against this Chinese-owned Chinese run application. They have both banned TikTok from government devices 
and are contemplating a complete ban. And why is that? National security. Let me start with America. This morning, the White House gave the government agencies 30 days to ensure that the app is removed from federal devices. Meaning that in the next 30 days, the app must be eliminated from all phones and systems that are issued by the government of the United States. And why is that? Due to the fear that China could be using this app to snoop on American officials. And Canada has taken a similar step. It has banned this Chinese application from all government-issued devices. And the reason is the same. A growing fear that TikTok could be collecting personal user information and sending it back to the regime that governs its operations. We're making the decision that uh, for government uh, employees, for government equipment, um, it is better uh, to not have them access TikTok uh, because of the concerns uh, that people have in terms of safety. Uh, this may be a first step, it may be the only step we need to take, but every step of the way we're going to be making sure uh, we're keeping Canadians safe. Now here's the thing, these steps by the US and Canada might impact only a small portion of TikTok's user base. But they could set in motion a wave of suspicion that will affect TikTok severely, especially in the United States. The U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee is set to vote on a legislation that will give the U.S. President Joe Biden the authority to ban TikTok, which is used by 100 million Americans. Plus, next month, the company's CEO is set to testify before a U.S. Commerce Committee. American observers say the grilling could culminate into the application being completely eliminated from American soil. And they also say such a ban would be unprecedented, unparalleled in its scale and impact. But by saying so, they are overlooking a major precedent, a precedent that India set way back in 2020. In June that year, the Indian government issued a sweeping ban on TikTok, citing issues of privacy and national sovereignty. At that time, TikTok had 200 million users in India. This was its largest market outside the mainland. Within a matter of 24 hours, India decimated this market. And this move came after weeks of escalating tensions, followed by violent clashes along the border. It was a digital strike no one expected. A strike that made China understand that it cannot underestimate India. That if talks and terror cannot go hand in hand with Pakistan, neither can border aggression and business with China. The point I'm trying to make is quite simple. New Delhi dealt with Beijing in the only language that it understands. And that's the language of strength. So why can't the West do the same? What is it so scared of? I ask these questions because for the last two years, America has been in two minds about banning Chinese applications. It has been debating the pros and the cons, weighing the costs and the benefits, assessing the gains and losses. And after two long years, when it finally does take a decision, it restricts that to federal employees. That's merely a few thousand people. Just what is stopping America from imposing a nationwide ban? Does TikTok pose a threat only to the federal employees? Is it not a threat to the countless American teenagers who use it? Are we to believe that the app is stealing the data of the government officials and not the data of the common man? I mean, what sort of logic are the American policymakers even implementing here? And it's not like they don't have enough evidence. 
from the FBI to the Pentagon to the CIA, time and again, various government organizations have raised fears that TikTok's owner, ByteDance, could be misusing the personal information of TikTok's American users, that it could be handing this information to the Chinese regime, which could then be using it for propaganda or pushing disinformation. And why just American agencies? TikTok's parent company itself has admitted to unintentional snooping. Have a look at this headline. In December 2020, an internal investigation by ByteDance found that four of its employees had inappropriately obtained the data of American TikTok users. And this included the data of two American reporters who worked for BuzzFeed and the Financial Times. And it doesn't end here. On your screen is a piece from the year 2018. It is about a meeting organized by the Internal Party Committee of ByteDance. This meeting was to learn how to quote-unquote implement the spirit of national propaganda. Why does a private company have a party committee? Well, because the law in China requires every company to set up party committees. Every company must have three or more members of the Communist Party, which means that the Chinese state is present in every boardroom of China. And that's not even all. China's national intelligence law makes it legally binding on all Chinese companies, and I repeat, all companies, to share the data and intelligence. So any Chinese app which says your user data is secure and is not being shared with China is lying. And this includes TikTok. From every video you upload on the app, to how long you watch those videos, to which videos you like, to which videos you share, to any messages that you exchange, your age, your contact list, your address, TikTok is recording all of this about you. And by all means, sharing it with its masters in Beijing. It has been over a year since the war broke out in Ukraine. Towns have been destructed, thousands have been killed, and the war still continues. While everyone thought Ukraine would collapse, it has been holding its ground and launching offensives. Because the country is not alone, Support has been pouring in from around the world. Kiev has received billions of dollars in aid. But just how much exactly? Let me tell you. It's more than you can imagine. A report by the Kiel Institute for the World Economy has made some interesting revelations. And the U.S. leads the chart. It has promised around $80 billion in aid to Ukraine. Last week, during a surprise visit to Kiev, President Joe Biden committed nearly half a billion dollars more. The total figure now stands close to $130 billion. EU institutions are next in line. They have pledged over $37 billion. And then comes the UK with $8.8 billion. All other donor countries, including Germany, Canada, Poland, France and the Netherlands, have provided around $16.5 million. Let's just look at what these amounts cover exactly. Governments are offering support in three forms. Number one being military aid. It pays for drones, tanks, missiles and other munition systems. It also funds training, logistics and intelligence support. The U.S. has committed some $46.6 billion in military support far more money than any other country is donating. The UK comes second with $5.1 billion. The EU follows with $3.3 billion. You see, most of the money is pledged to Ukraine in the form of military aid. It arms the soldiers. It is keeping the war going. Number two is financial aid. It's all about the economy. It keeps Ukraine's government operating. It pays the civil servants, the healthcare workers, the educators. 
The EU has promised over $32 billion in financial aid to Ukraine. The US has pledged $26.7 billion. The UK has offered over $3 billion. Number three is humanitarian aid, and this includes food assistance, safe drinking water, medical supplies, and other necessities. It is for Ukrainians displaced by the conflict. The US has promised close to $4 billion. The EU has pledged $1.6 billion. You see, money is pouring into the war from all over the world. And America is leading the way. But do you know what happens when so much money is spent so quickly? When there is little to no oversight? Well, it leads to fraud, waste and abuse. And there is a high chance that the dollars fall into corrupt pockets. And it has happened in Ukraine. Scores of political leaders and officials have been sacked. On Sunday, President Volodymyr Zelensky fired Eduard Moskalov. He was the commander of Ukraine's joint forces. In January, remember, Ukraine went on a purge. We told you about this. Officials were sacked on grounds of corruption. There was Vyacheslav Shapovalov, the deputy defense minister of the country, Oleksiy Samonenko, the deputy prosecutor general of Ukraine, Vazai Lozinski, the deputy infrastructure minister, Vyacheslav Negoda, and Ivan Lokeria, the deputy ministers for development of communities. And these, by the way, are only a few of the names. Several more were dismissed from their positions. Ukraine is also set to transfer the defense minister, Oleksiy Reznikov. Why is that? In response to the corruption scandals that have gripped the country. Zelensky has been trying hard to root out corruption. But just how feasible is that amid a war? Russian troops are attacking Ukraine from outside and its own officials are eating it up from inside. The West is showering aid on Ukraine, but, but it's also concerned over the misuse of this aid. Once U.S. equipment is handed to the Ukrainian government, American officials have little knowledge of where it goes. They rely on the Ukrainian government for such information. And as I told you, the government is full of corrupt officials. So of what use is it? Who exactly receives the aid? Is it being diverted to the wrong hands? Is it being stolen by terrorists? We can only guess. Have a look at this report by Russian state-owned news agency. It says the U.S. weapons are ending up in hands of Swedish gangs. Swedish media is saying the same, by the way. Swedish arms smugglers have re received requests to procure weapons from Ukraine. And why is that? for further sale to criminal gangs in the country. The Russian political leaders have warned for months. They say that weapons sent to Ukraine are very likely to end up in the black market. They could reach the hands of organized criminals in Europe and beyond. So I ask you again, of what use is this aid if it is going to end up in the wrong hands, in the wrong places? And what is the West doing about this? It is sending out weapons like anything. Should it not be overseeing how they are used? Our next story is from Pakistan. This afternoon, it was dealt another economic blow, one that could further hinder Islamabad's prospects of securing international loans. Have a look at this headline. Global ratings agency Moody's has cut Pakistan's sovereign credit rating. Earlier, the rating was CAA1. It has now been downgraded to CAA3. And what explains this? The country's increasingly fragile liquidity. You see, this step has been taken because Pakistan's foreign reserves are far less than necessary to cover its imports. Also, its external debt obligations in the immediate term. Moody says this has raised the risks of a debt default, hence the downgrade. So just how will this impact Pakistan? 
Well, these ratings will come into play every time Pakistan gets a foreign investor. And these investors will assess Islamabad's ability to repay the loans and live up to the investments based on its credit rating. Simply put, this report is going to hurt Pakistan financially. It could make the current turmoil even worse. Is Pakistan in a position to deal with this? Well, not really. The situation is already quite bad. Have a look at this headline. Due to the current economic crunch and the worsening financial condition, Pakistan has allegedly de decided to cease clearing of bills. And this includes salaries and pensions of the federal ministers. At least that is what a section of the Pakistani media is saying. It says the Accountant General of Pakistan Revenues, or AGPR, has apparently been instructed to halt salaries of the government officials. Pakistan's finance minister says this is not true. Media reports say he could be lying. In any case, we don't expect the Pakistani government to be truthful about the state of affairs there. Because there are so many crises that have gripped the country at the same time. The government is having a hard time trying to explain to the people just what in the world is going on. Take this report, for instance. It says Pakistani industries are bracing themselves for cuts in production and the workforce, especially the textile sector. It has reportedly witnessed a 14.8% decline in exports. And this is according to Pakistan's own Bureau of Statistics. It says the 2022 floods in Pakistan washed away 45% of the cotton crop, leaving the textile mills without essential raw materials. And this has hindered the ability of these mills to produce textiles. The fall in exports is staggering. They have reportedly declined at a rate of 2.5% on month-over-month -month basis. And the result is this. The Trade Union Federation of Pakistan says that as many as 1 million informal workers may lose their jobs. 1 million of them. Most of them will be from the textile sector. Remember, this is in addition to the job losses that have unfolded throughout last year. In 2022, at least 25,000 workers in the auto sector had lost their jobs. This was due to an unabated drop in the annual sales. And what's worse, the people who lost their jobs rarely have other alternatives. Which means they will remain unemployed in the near future. I'm not the one saying this. Surveys are. Look at this report. Dawn carried this last month. It says in 2023... Around 6.2 million Pakistani citizens will remain unemployed. That is around 8.5% of the country's total workforce of 73 million. It will remain jobless. And it doesn't end there. The rate of unemployment in Pakistan has been on a steady rise, especially in the last four years. In 2019, the rate of unemployment was 3.9%. In 2020, it rose to 4.3%. In 2021, it increased further to 6.5%. And this year, it is projected to grow further to 8.5%. It's truly a sad state of affairs. And what's worse, reports say this crisis will not go away in 2023. And the factors that impact unemployment are only set to get more severe in the years ahead. And what does that mean? That not just 2023 and 2024, this entire decade could prove to be rather tough for Pakistan. As millions more could lose their jobs and get sucked into the abyss of unemployment. The question is, will such massive joblessness not feed the networks of organized crime? Will it not become a more fertile breeding ground for poverty? Will it not feed ignorance, exploitation, extremism and terrorism? By all means, it will. Unemployment is a volcano waiting to erupt in Pakistan. And when it does, it could engulf vast parts of the country and rupture the country's socio-economic fabric. 
Forget the Shehbaz Sharif government. We doubt if any consecutive government will be able to do much about this. How many layers does the earth have? We answered this question for you just a few days back when the monster quake struck Turkey and Syria. We told you that the earth has four layers, the crust, the mantle, the outer core and the inner core. Between then and now, scientists have found a new layer within our planet. They now say the earth actually has five distinct layers. How does this new discovery affect you and all those who live on earth? Our next report telling you. The crust, the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. These are four layers of the Earth. But that's not all. Scientists have now found a fifth layer. It is being called the innermost inner core. How is this layer different from the other four? Well, let's first learn a bit about them. This is the crust, and it is where we live. This is where the continents are, and the oceans are. And that's why the crust is often referred to in terms of continental plates and oceanic plates. Then comes the mantle. This layer is about 3,000 kilometers thick. The mantle is hotter than the crust. Also, it is in semi-molten form, meaning the upper part of the mantle is hard, whereas if you go deeper, the rock begins melting. Then comes the outer core. It is made of metals like iron and nickel. But these metals are all in liquid form. This layer is extremely, extremely hot. We are talking about close to 5,000 degrees Celsius. Then comes the inner core. It is hotter, but the metals here are in solid form. The inner core makes up less than a percent of the Earth's volume. The new layer lies at the core of these four. It too is in a solid state and consists of an iron-nickel alloy. How is it different from the inner core, you ask? Well, its crystal structure is different. Scientists at an Australian university studied data from 200 quakes of magnitude 6 and higher. They found that shock waves from earthquakes reverberate at a different speed through this layer compared to the rest of the inner core meaning it is different and distinct from the rest of the inner core. This isn't the first time. This fifth layer is being spoken about. The idea was first proposed 20 years ago, and now we have details of this layer. How does it change your relationship with the Earth? You see, the inner core is often considered as a time capsule in our planet's history. The more we learn about it, the more we understand the Earth's origin and evolution. The more scientists learn about the Earth's magnetic field and the more it helps them understand the planet. Also, the additional layer means your geography books will have to be rewritten. Technology comes with its own downsides. These days, youngsters get exposed to the internet from a very early age. Sometimes they don't really understand the consequences of certain actions. And many fall prey to cyberbullying. In times like this, however, harsh it may sound, it has become a reality that teenagers share explicit imagery. Some do it willingly, some are blackmailed for it, some are forced into it. And such incidents rarely reach responsible adults. Not only does it put youngsters in dangerous situations, it also makes them vulnerable, it makes them prone to mental distress. So what do you do? What is the way out? You might have come across this warning. Once you send that photo, you can't take it back. 
But is that enough? Maybe it's time to give some control back to teenagers. And a new tool aims to do exactly that. It's called Take It Down. Living up to its name, the tool can help teenagers take down explicit images and videos of themselves from the internet. Let's just have a look at how it works. Take It Down is operated by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. It is funded in parts by Meta Platforms. It lets teenagers anonymously report their explicit images posted online. Young adults who fall prey to child porn can also do it. The tool creates a sort of a digital fingerprint for the image. And it then tracks the imagery online and takes it down. It can also block it from being shared. The tool can detect AI-generated deep fakes as well. Deep fakes are created to look like actual people saying or doing things that they actually did not do. Now, Take It Down cannot remove photos from everywhere, but it can from the platforms participating in the initiative. And this includes Facebook, Instagram, OnlyFans, Yobo, Pornhub. However, the tool is a work in progress. It cannot help if the image has been shared on encrypted platforms. And WhatsApp is the biggest example here. Twitter and TikTok have also not committed to the project. Despite some shortcomings, it can potentially help teenagers worldwide. Law enforcement has always been there around child porn, but is it really effective for youngsters? For one, it is not anonymous. And second, it involves other people. People a child might be uncomfortable sharing these details with. But the tool eliminates both these factors. A vulnerable teenager can anonymously report the image without involving others, without going through long legal procedures. In 2017, Meta, which was then Facebook, also tried to create a similar tool, but it was for adults. And it was very problematic. Why is that? Because it asked people to send their nudes to Facebook. A social media site which isn't trustworthy itself. It tested out the service in Australia briefly, but it wasn't expanded to other countries due to its shortfalls. In 2021, Meta helped launch Stop NCII or Non Consensual Im Intimate Images, famously known as Revenge Porn. The site is run by a UK non profit, but anyone around the world can use it. This was again only for adults. Online sexual extortion and exploitation has only gotten worse. And Take It Down comes as a ray of hope for teenagers. Many tech companies already use this system to share, take down and report child sexual abuse. And while the tool seems promising, there is a major hurdle in the way. And that is participation of the tech companies. More social media platforms need to participate in the project. Sites like TikTok and Twitter have millions of users and they cannot fall behind. A wholesome meal, a good drink and your favorite comfort movie. That sounds like the perfect weekend plan, does it not? But can you imagine being jailed for watching an episode of Friends? or any other sitcom and movie that could be your favorite? Sitcoms and movies provide us endless comfort and entertainment. But they are forbidden fruits for the people of North Korea. Under Kim Jong-un's totalitarian regime, he is carrying out a vicious crackdown on Western media. North Korea has threatened to punish parents for letting their children watch Hollywood blockbusters. As per the new rules, parents will be sent to labor camps for six months. And the country is not sparing children either. They will have to serve five years of imprisonment. Smuggling Western media across the border could even be punished by execution. Last year, two high school students were executed. What for? For watching South Korean and American movies. Can you believe that? It sounds like a plot of a dystopian novel, does it not? But it actually happened. 
In the past, parents could get away with a serious warning if their children were caught in possession of foreign media. However, this time, no leniency will be shown. There is also an increased pressure on the parents. They have been asked to educate children properly in socialist ideals. The warning was issued during a compulsory neighborhood watch unit meeting. And this is what was reportedly said. If parents do not educate their children from moment to moment, from moment to moment, they will dance and sing of capitalism and become anti-socialists. That's not all. You know how the K-pop fever has spread around the world? Well, North Koreans cannot jump on that train either. Anyone found performing like a South Korean will also be slapped with a six-month term as will their parents. But where is all this even coming from? Why this sudden tightening of the rules? In truth, it is driven by fear. North Korea's younger population is being exposed to the values and norms of other countries. More young people have been seen picking up South Korean slang, hairstyles, fashion trends. And this is something that Kim Jong-un cannot tolerate. So, he is exercising absolute control. And speaking of Hollywood, why is China suddenly warming up to it? For the last couple of years, China was trying to close its doors to Hollywood. So much so that Marvel movies were not allowed to release in China. And now, a red carpet is being rolled out for Hollywood big names, including Marvel. There has been a twist in the plot. And our next report tells you all about it. China and Hollywood is like Romeo and Juliet. It's a love story that makes many uncomfortable. But it's a love story nonetheless. Until 1994, China would allow only 10 Hollywood movies to enter the country. And then China opened up. The Chinese rushed to the theatres playing Hollywood movies. And producers sitting in Los Angeles went out of their way to woo the Chinese audience. Chinese actors were cast in Hollywood movies. Scenes were edited to suit the Chinese censors. The result was money. Endless money. In 2020, China became the world's biggest movie market. The year before that, Marvel's Avengers Endgame earned 4 billion renminbi in China. 4 billion. The number caught people's attention and before you knew it, China began closing the door on Marvel movies. Top Gun Maverick was not allowed to release in Chinese theatres. Neither was Spider-Man No Way Home. Why? Did China change its mind about adding to Hollywood's profits? Or did she want superheroes to look more like him, you know, Chinese? By 2020, a certain body had started playing a big role in the Chinese film industry, the Film Administration Bureau. Its top boss was a loyalist of President Xi Jinping, and it looked like the Bureau was trying to prune film distribution to ensure that the silver screen mirrored Xi's likes, and that of his party. The result was projected for everyone to see. In 2022, only 29 Hollywood films were allowed to enter China. Then came 2023. A lot changed in China. Protests had forced the country to reopen. Theatres reopened too. And guess which poster went up? Avatar The Way of Water. The Hollywood magnum opus of sorts was given an extended play over the Chinese New Year. And now a couple of other Hollywood big banner films have been given a go ahead for release too. This includes Marvel's very own Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Also Ant-Man and The Wasp Quantumania. So what happened? What explains the plot twist? To begin with, a certain change of guard. The head of China's Film Administration Bureau has changed. His name is Mao Yu. He's an alumnus of the Beijing Film Academy, which has given China some of its best directors. Some of these directors and producers feel that Mao is and will be more empathetic towards the film fraternity as compared to his predecessor. That's one. Here's another change, the change in China's economic outlook. You see, Beijing needs business and it needs people to go to the movies and spend. China is currently not in a position to pick and choose which movies should and should not be screened. 
Also, Chinese masters are in no position to attract more criticism. Xi Jinping has managed to drive his people to the edge with his draconian zero COVID policy. The people are angry. Keeping them away from their favorite brand of movies could make them angrier. And for all you know, the climax won't be much to Xi's liking. Is that why China has rolled out the red carpet once again for Hollywood? We may have the answer by half time. And our next story is about a visa scheme that comes as a huge opportunity for Indians, Indians who wish to love, live and work in the UK, also vice versa. The scheme kickstarts today. It is called the Young Professional Scheme. It is a reciprocal scheme under which Indian and British nationals aged between 18 and 30 can apply to live and work in either country for a period of up to two years. This scheme was signed off by the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his British counterpart Rishi Sunak at the G20 summit in Indonesia. So what exactly is the scheme all about? Who all can apply? How can you apply? We break it all down for you over the next few minutes. If you wish to apply for the scheme to live and work in the UK, first things first, who is eligible? Let me just list out some of the eligibility criteria. To be eligible for an India Young Professional Scheme visa, you must be an Indian national or citizen. You must be between the ages of 18 and 30. You have to have a qualification at the bachelor's degree level or above. And you must have 2,530 pounds in savings to support yourself in the UK. You should not have any children under the age of 18 who live with you or who you are, or you, who you are financially responsible for. Next, how do you apply for the visa? You must first apply to and be selected in the India Young Professional Scheme ballot before you can apply for your visa. And if you are eligible, you can enter the India Young Professional Scheme ballot. This ballot is now open. It will close at 2.30 p.m. India Standard Time on the 2nd of March. And if you are successful in the ballot, you will receive an invitation to apply for the visa. You then prepare the documents that you need to apply and then go ahead with your application. The successful entries will be picked at random. You will be sent the results by email within two weeks of the ballot closing. It's free to enter the ballot. You should only enter if you plan to apply for the visa and are able to meet the financial, educational and other requirements. There are 2,400 visas available in the February ballot. And if you are successful in the ballot, you will be invited to apply for a visa. You'll need to apply by the deadline that's given in your invitation. And this is usually 30 days after you get the invitation. Once you've applied online and proved your identity and provided your documents, you will usually get a decision on your visa within three weeks. You will be contacted if your application will take longer for example, because your supporting documents need to be verified, you need to attend an interview, or because of your personal circumstances. Next, how much does this cost? The visa application fee is £259, and then there is the healthcare surcharge of £940. Like I already mentioned, you also have to prove you have £2,530 in personal savings. Next question, for how long can you stay in the UK if you get the visa? You will be given a visa to live and work in the UK for up to 24 months. You can enter the UK at any time while your visa is valid and leave and come back at any time during your stay. You can refer to the British High Commission's website for further details. Now, this was for the Indians who wish to apply. Remember, like I mentioned right at the outset, this is a reciprocal scheme. The Indian High Commission in London has opened its visa application process for the UK nationals to apply as well, coinciding with the ballot opened by the British High Commission in New Delhi for the Indian graduates. And the Indian High Commission's website provides details for the applicants. It offers young UK citizens a chance to come to India to live and work for up to two years. And again, who is eligible? You should be between 18 to 30 years of age. 
you must hold a valid graduation degree and hold a valid passport with six months validity. You have to submit the proof of financial viability for managing your expenses during the stay. And you should not have a minor child below the age of 18. You have to submit your application under the scheme through the High Commission of India in the UK. The application will be considered only after verification of the required documents. The application fee is £720. The launch of this UK-India Young Professional Scheme has been called a significant moment for the bilateral relationship between the UK and India. And it's also an effort to propel the ongoing free trade agreement negotiations that are set to enter the next round of talks. Let's now tell you what else made news around the world. Time for Gravitas Global Headlines. Russian media releases video of Su-25 warplanes said to be launching missiles in the area of Bakhmut, a city in Ukraine's east that has seen intense fighting between Russian and Ukrainian forces. Russian forces are pressing forward their offensive to encircle and capture the city of Bakhmut, where the commander of Ukraine's ground forces has described the situation as extremely tense. Hundreds held demonstrations in Tel Aviv against recent violence in the West Bank. Protesters scuffle with Israeli police. U.S. State Department steps up calls for Israel and Palestinians to de-escalate tensions. Hong Kong will drop its COVID-19 mask mandate from March this year. The region's chief executive made the announcement saying it aims to lure back visitors and business and restore normal life. However, in high-risk places such as hospitals, administrators will be allowed to decide whether to mandate masks or not. The United Nations has raised around $1.2 billion as part of its $4.3 billion aid plan for Yemen. The West Asian nation is in urgent need of assistance, as the Eighth Year War has left millions of people suffering. Underfunding has seen agencies scale back Yemen aid projects, including food rations, in the past couple of years. Nigeria's opposition parties call for the cancellation of the election over vote-counting irregularities they say were found in the results announced so far. Delhi Deputy Chief Minister Manish Sisodia and his cabinet colleagues Satyender Jain have resigned from their posts. Both are behind bars, facing charges of corruption and money laundering. Soldiers in a northern Mexican border city allegedly killed five unarmed men on Sunday. A local human rights group made the allegations on Monday and called on the government to investigate the shootings. It said that the five people were shot while driving in the city of Nuevo Laredo, near the U.S.-Mexico border. A string of tornadoes roared through central Oklahoma, leaving thousands of people without power and causing injuries to dozens of locals. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Gravitas tonight. We are leaving you with Gravitas images. Thanks very much for watching.